Hello and welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast, and this is our watch along of Princess Tutu. Very excited about this one. My name is Vry Kaiser, and I'm an editor and contributor at Anime Feminist. You can find out more about what I do by checking my pinned tweet at writer Vry, or you can find the other podcast I co-host at Trash Pod. And today I am very lucky to have two guests with me. Not really guests. Uh, one of them is Chiaki. She's a member of our staff and she's making her Sterling podcast debut with this one. And our other guest is Miranda Sanchez, who you all may remember from the Kill a Kill podcast. Uh, if you guys want to introduce yourself and plug the internet things you do. Sure, I guess I can go. Um, hi, I'm Chiaki Hirai. Uh, I guess I am the newest editor to start at Anime Feminist recently last year. Uh, aside from working here, I'm a beat reporter for a Japanese-American newspaper in San Francisco. And you can find me online at, at Chiaki747 at um, Twitter or Mastodon. Um, yeah, that's about it. Cool. And hello, I'm Miranda Sanchez. First off, Congrats, Chiaki. That's awesome to work with Anime Feminist. I love the crew over there very much. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so I work at IGN. Um, I kind of run a lot of our anime content, uh, except for the bad stuff. I always like to say that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I officially, unofficially kind of run what we do over there. Um, I am a senior editor, so I also cover a lot of video games. I help our wiki team. Um, and of course our core editorial for game reviews and everything else. And then you can find me online pretty much everywhere at Havoc Rose, and that's Havoc with a K, because I was 12 years old when I made that handle, and I said, a K looks cool. That's a bold commitment. I respect I mean, that. I mean, it's the same for me too, right? Like, I've used Chiaki since middle school. <laughs> <laughs> that's adorable. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and get into it. I have been wanting to do this particular watch along for, oh, at least a year. Uh, Princess Tutu is one of my favorite anime of all time. Uh, in my mind, it is the embodiment of everything good that shoujo can do as a genre, basically. Uh, I think if you are used to me being sort of the the cranky pedant on other podcasts, don't worry. I will be nothing but gushing, <laughs> and it will be a problem for this one. Aww. Uh, <laughs> I'm very excited to hear you excited about the show. <laughs> I'm happy to see <laughs> happiness from you, for once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, this confirms all my worst fears about myself. <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit of info, just basic background. This show actually connects to a lot of shows we've already covered on the podcast. So it came out in 2002. It was an anime original, although there was later a manga, which don't bother. It sucks. Uh, it was directed by Junichi Sato, a very big name in the anime industry. Uh, you may know him as the head director for the first season of Sailor Moon and also the Doom Tree, uh, Alan and Ale segment of Sailor Moon R, although he continued to work on the series all the way through Super S, I believe. He also most recently served as the head director for Hugto Precure, the Precure everybody likes. Mm -hmm. So he's still working very much today. Uh, the series composition is Michiko Yokote, uh, who people might know from these watch-alongs for uh, being the head writer of Shirobako. Although while researching this, I also discovered that she did series composition for Gravitation, and it's kind of messing me up. Not gonna lie. I know her uh, more for um, uh, Melody Peachy Peachy Peach, which was uh, what yeah, I that was yeah. She she was big in on that and the the Ah oh My Goddess movie she wrote as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff in the industry, and she's also currently right. Well, it'll be over by the time this comes out, but uh, the winter season she was the head writer for Magnificent Kotobuki as well. The studio oh. that made Princess Tutu is sadly defunct. It was made in 2003 by former Toei employees, uh, and it was subsumed in 2009. But their last project was yet another podcast uh, favorite, Yamada's First Time, which was the first full was the last full series that they did before being absorbed back into a larger company, which is kind of sad. All right, uh, I think that settles it up. I could geek out all day about voice actor stuff. Uh, there's a weird mix of still still very active seiyu on this one uh, and people who just kind of didn't do stuff after the 2000s, but I recognize that that's of interest only to me. <laughs> so, and also 
as I discovered, Princess Tutu is only streaming in dub format. Yeah, uh, that was what I found yeah. first. And I was like, well, I guess I'll just stick with the dub for simplicity's sake. And I already have a high dive subscription, so I might as well use it. Mm -hmm. So you both watched it in English then? Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I have watched this in both versions. Um, I, I, I think it's a good dub. I have an immense fondness for it, although I you know, respect that it's a weird and kind of annoying thing when you can't access the original language version mm -hmm. at all. And it makes me kind of sad that that's not even an option. Uh, Sentai did just do a really nice re-release in Blu-ray that's like high def and, and cleaned up all the colors, similar to what Funimation did for Escaflone, and it's pretty affordable. So if people are interested, it's worth picking up. <laughs> uh, so you two are watching this for the first time. You want to give like... Any uh, sort of personal, had you heard of it before? Uh, was there a reason you hadn't given it a shot? Uh, this is the part where I yeah, stopped talking okay. for a while. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so for me, at least, I knew about Princess Tutu, but I didn't have any reason to watch it, I guess. Like, I have this massive backlog of older shows that I really want to get to. And I knew that some of my friends had really enjoyed it. Um, and that was about it. That's all I knew about it. And then, of course, uh, getting into it. I was very surprised to see that Duck was actually a duck. Completely baffled. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was pretty much my extent of Princess Tutu. Unexpected. That I had for it, yeah. Unexpected. Yeah, yeah. A completely fresh. That's that's neat because I mean, like this series has got quite the reputation at this point after all these years. Yeah. Ch Chiaki, I know you'd been hounded about it for like a long time. Yeah. So you know, as much as I enjoy shoujo, it's not something that is first choice for me when I get to watching things and I too have a huge backlog um, so back in college people started telling me oh you should really watch Princess Tutu and I never did the only thing I really watched was that uh, Holden Now AMV and I was like oh this looks really great which I'm guessing is totally different in tone from the actual <laughs> show now that I've watched the first six episodes <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> it's a good AMV yeah it's a good AMV <laughs> oh I, actually that does lead me to my next question is are are you two then uh, fans of, like, do you watch a lot of shoujo in general? I do. I like shoujo. Okay. I kind of watch a little bit of everything, but that's usually my motto. But, um, yeah, very fond of shoujo. Yeah, not against it at all. Um, I, I've i enjoyed a lot of shoujo, but I think um, I'll go for more, like, sane and stuff, usually. Um, yeah, that's, on my own. that's good where I am as well. I, it's... It's kind of one of those things I feel compelled to ask because Princess Tutu had a very strong contingent of crossover, uh, especially in the 2000s. You know, there was this very bro-y posturing for, uh, contingent of, of male fans who were like, real men watch Princess Tutu. And it was always kind of interesting to watch this, this wanting to acknowledge that this show is good, but also having to couch it in well we don't normally watch this kind of girly stuff but this one's really good so mm. so it's always kind of interesting to me i feel like this is a good shoujo gateway series for a lot of people and, and like i said i feel like it embodies a lot of what the genre does really really well um and i guess so having come in with all of that what did you think of these first six episodes hmm, my first thought was i was surprised by how theatrical it is like, it really buys into the idea of, like, this is a story and a play, and you kind of have, like, these very obvious chorus characters. Um, and, of course, a lot of, like, Nutcracker music, which is very intentional for other reasons. Um, and I was really impressed with how much I just, like, liked how sweet it was. I don't know, like, just overall, like, I was really excited to keep watching more, of course, because I think we ended at a good point where it's just like, oh, you should should keep watching um it's gonna get real yeah i really like duck <laughs> as a protagonist she's very interesting and of course cute um i like her own internal dilemma of just always saying i'm just a duck you know um mm -hmm. and how she addresses situations and how i think this is a really interesting one too because it does feel like a show that's very aware of what kind of audience it could have um it leaves a lot for you to figure mm. out but it also has like that helping hand aspect of like in the very beginning it kind of does a very quick description of like what the episode's kind of about 
or um, some thematic things. And sometimes it just straight up tells you super important information that if you didn't put together yourself, just at least kind of confirms that, which I could see being helpful for like younger audiences. Yeah, it's definitely, and I don't mean this as, as a knock on the show at all, but I've always thought it as, as baby's first Utena, like in that it is made for probably a 10 to 12 audience and it is teaching you to learn to pick up on those thematic threads in a way that I think is really neat and important. Absolutely. It doesn't feel belittling or any way, but it definitely has those moments where you're like, oh yes, you're trying to help me understand this thing that I understand. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I've been noticing this time around that you can actually, um, Underneath the titles of the episodes, it lists the major musical movement from ballets that uh, that is in the soundtrack. It lists them in German, so <laughs> which is a little bit nostalgic for me because my dad spoke a lot of German around the house growing up. I can't speak it, but you know it comforts me to see it. Yeah. So it's it's nice to see that. And actually, um, another interesting thing is that this is you know this is a series that plays a lot with intertextuality. Obviously, the fairy tale stuff is is obvious right off the bat. You know, you've got Giselle and Sleeping Beauty, but watching it, it's also very much commenting on shoujo archetypes as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I am just endlessly delighted by the fact that Lillier is this incredibly vicious takedown of Tomoyo <laughs> because she's she's absolutely adoring of, of Duck's every movement, but in a really condescending kind of sadistic way. And it makes me laugh so hard. <laughs> yeah, those are always really good. Tell your friends when they're wrong or being goofy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all... They are all archetypal shoujo characters and archetypal sort of fairy tale characters. I'm really interested by the places where those kind of meet and overlap and also where they chafe against each other. And I, I feel like Duck has inherited a lot of Usagi's physical comedy from the first season of Sailor Moon, which is so nice to see. Yeah, mm. it makes sense with the director, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't see enough so. of that. Jackie, you watched, you watched some of... Uh, of Hugto, didn't you? Is, is no, I have actually that? not. I have not actually seen Hugto. Um, just the tweets online, unfortunately. Ah, which yeah. I mean, like it's it's like watching Hugto. Yeah. Uh, I Hugto. feel. I mean, from screen caps, there seemed to be a little bit of that, but I'm not sure if it was like as big. It, it did really stand out to me when I was watching uh, Princess Tutu, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, especially in the first two episodes, I feel they, they really went overboard almost even on that. It's wacky. Yeah. She, she's got them noodly limbs. But, I mean, in a way, it, it is definitely very, it's a lot. But also, I kind of miss it because I'm old now. And I, I really liked that kind of slapsticky shoujo protagonist, which I don't think you see as much anymore. Even in, we've had a, a spate of good Otome protagonists lately, but, but they're still... Never quite as ridiculous as like as Duck or Miyaka or or Usagi were allowed to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. these were always hard to be the person in the know. Um, actually, I think this is the first time I've had to do it. But um, I guess I wanted to know if you had noticed anything about. You mentioned the show is certainly not subtle at all about you know these are the roles you're destined to play. Like, you know, you have the prince and the raven and princess, you know, the princess. And I guess I wanted to know your thoughts on that and what you think the series is doing with it at this point. I thought that was kind of an interesting convention of storytelling. It feels almost like fourth wall breaking, or I guess it is fourth wall breaking to say, mm -hmm. you know, hey, your story just started yesterday and, you know, it's okay. That's just where you're at. Like, that was an interesting concept that kind of stuck with me. Yeah, that idea, stories begin suddenly. It's such a good line. Adel's, Adel's full of just, like, pull quotes that you put on your wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love Adel. Anytime she pops up, my, or I start hearing the music, it's like, yes, Adel time. <laughs> <laughs> She's very comforting. Yeah. Um, I really yeah. like these roles because I feel like, well... Somebody messaged me on Instagram when I was saying that I was watching this and said, oh, man, this has, like, one of the best twists. I was like, well, oh. But I kind I of have... 
figure. I'll that. reach through the internet and crush them <laughs> if they ruin this for you. They didn't tell me what it was. I'm like, this is one of my favorites. I don't want to say what it is, but like, it's really good. And of course, like, stick with it. I was like, oh, I plan on to. But um, I kind of feel like that's the case just because of like the art for like Princess Tutu on High Dive is like a little like, oh, okay, well, this is interesting. Um, mm. it, it looks a lot darker than I think the show comes off as. I, I like that this whole thing is about like this unfinished story just kind of took a life of its own. And so I'm really into the idea that although they're trying to play out these roles, their roles don't really matter in the same way anymore. Because if the story is kind of in its own place and like kind of just following its own direction, then that means that their roles aren't necessarily determining their fate. So I think Mm -hmm. that's something that Duck still needs to realize in the first six episodes and definitely hasn't, but she's a young girl, you know, still figuring it all out. Just found out she's Princess Tutu, so I'm gonna give her some time. Yeah, these characters are ostensibly 13, 14, but they feel 12. Oh, yeah. They feel like wee 12-year-old babs. Jackie, did you have anything to add on that one? Uh, I mean, I think, and this kind of goes to what I felt, because, um, you know, Mm -hmm. I saw the part where you know it's like dreams and your wish dream and your wish is granted you know this um that's the great thing about stories like drosselmeyer Meyer gives uh duck her kind of wish to become a girl right and i kind of read that mm-hmm. as sort of a um, trans um narrative as well like it's it's kind of what spoke to me about the series yeah. at the very mm-hmm. beginning where it's like oh yeah you can be whatever you want as long as you really believe it but at the same time like in that same breath um right afterward he says, like, the duck will become a girl and the girl will... I, I, I mean, um, you know, if you do or say or do anything that resembles a duck, you turn back into one. And that's kind of a thing that also um, reflects to me. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I totally can be a girl anytime I want uh, until I, real, you know, think back and, you know, um, uh, dysphoria hits me hard. <laughs> yeah, 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 that... I guess I'd never thought about it watching the series, but it definitely has. Although I will say that the series doesn't really play on that in any kind of like useful triumphant manner. Like the series is doing a lot of other interesting things, but that one. Yeah, that was definitely like a one episode, like, oh, just one moment of, huh, interesting. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's it's one of those where like, I I don't want to stomp on this, but I feel like this one in particular, I know that's going to end up being disappointing if we follow that through line to its full conclusion. Oh, yeah, no, I felt like (laughs) um, the whole transforms into a duck thing was very much um, underplayed throughout the uh, Mm -hmm. six episodes. I do love how much there's there's a lot of comedy nudity that's never gross and like anime has battered me in my soul so deeply oh my gosh yes it's like Mm -hmm. hey everyone who's trying to do this here's how you do it correctly Mm -hmm. i feel that's more prevalent in like early um shows that are a little bit older because nudity in like japanese anime especially children's show is pretty prevalent i feel just not as like gross because it was for children yeah yeah like between like so much 90s glowy nudity like (laughs) sailor moon had a lot of it or Mm -hmm. even like wacky comedy penises in dragon ball and even then it was just like you know it was goofy ridiculous mm-hmm. i miss that yeah me too i miss I, I miss being able to watch a show and not say is this person gonna get arrested in five years <laughs> yeah i mean this is such a good way to do it too and like you see it like just how it's like the camera angle and of course the way they're drawn and it's everything around it. It's just done so much better and it's actually funny and it doesn't make me feel bad for watching it. It does occasionally get very convenient where t- Duck needs to not be around to intervene in something. Don't worry, we've got a duck for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that she could anyway because her actions are to an extent constrained by the imb- the avatar of George R.R. R. Martin and Gen Urobuchi, Drosselmeyer, the lover of tragedy porn. Oh, indeed. Everyone just gets to be sad. Yeah, it's so interesting to look at his character from a modern perspective where, like, in a post-Madoka anime landscape, where he's he's just this gleeful figure about how sad everyone is and how everything is going horribly and it's going to be a delightful tragedy. Weirdly reminds me of Panic at the Disco. That's what I was saying. It's like, it's beautiful, but also very sad always. Mm-hmm. There's very much a sense of there's the story and then there's the story being enforced 
And then there's all these other stories, because you have the element of fabulism as well. You know, characters come into town and they're like, was it always like this? Well, I guess it must have always been like this. Yeah, I particularly like that episode, I think, maybe the most. Um, just because we finally get that confirmation that this town is very weird and everyone's just fine with it because, like, that is the status quo at this point. I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, that was episode six, right? Yes. Yep. That was um, the last one of this set. I also always appreciate it whenever a show lets us all be very impressed by a woman and everyone can be impressed by a woman no matter their preference and be very attractive. Like, wow, so beautiful. So cool. And just duck is a disaster bisexual and i love her it's beautiful i love it so much <laughs> she's so good i feel like this is the part of the episode where i have to ask about fakir my son <laughs> who i always forget is so terrible early on yeah oh. sorry i mean you're 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 promising me a lot by saying i am i'm gonna like fakir but at, at this moment i'm just like man i hope i hope duck just steals Muto away and just leaves those assholes behind. Yeah, there's, like, no <laughs> violence at this point, but I'm like, wow, I hope there's, like, a little bit of violence. Because <laughs> Vakir needs to go down. But you say, like, your son, Vakir. I'm like, oh, okay. Keep yeah. a on him. Yeah, it's, well, it's interesting from a rewatch perspective, I guess, because Vakir is, is no excuses awful in in the first couple of episodes he's he's very controlling and belittling and he's just kind of a dick to everyone but you do get an interesting shift towards the end of these where when he it, it in that sixth episode when uh muto collapses and he realizes that he is oh okay i have confirmed because he has that moment of are you having an emotion are you just doing this to fuck with me am i annoyed at this but at, in that episode six, you have that shift where he says, okay, an emotion is happening. And he changes into this this very definite caretaker role, which I find to be an interesting, a sort of interesting indicator of his character and where they're trying to go with it, even at this stage. But it looks bad, right? Because he's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because Muto, when he's alone, is just like this blank person who just stares off into the distance and can't do anything and probably wouldn't even take care of himself if no one else did it for him so i think the abusiveness of the relationship is i think the most off-putting part of course but i see the need for it because you know i guess not having heart means you can't do anything or have any thoughts of your own so <laughs> um I see why Vakir is so strict with him and is suddenly surprised when he doesn't have to be as strict or feels maybe more of the need to be even more strict. Um, I think the thing that has me most curious is like why there's so much of like he does not need a heart. Like do not give him his heart back. It's like wh why? When if you if you care about him, wouldn't you wanna you know you wanna let us know why? Yeah. Tell I, us. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. By all means, I encourage you, Chiaki, to spill your terrible bile. This is not my attempt. I mean, this I, is I... not my attempt to stop it. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, uh, Fakir and Rue are almost, like, even like, abusive in the sense that they're trying to keep Muto all to themselves. Mm -hmm. like by, yeah, I think that's fair. Oh, for sure. By just, you know, not letting him uh, be himself. And it, it feels very, like, you know, Sleeping Beauty, kind of caged, um, hidden away um, sort of thing. I'm just mm -hmm. like, no, like, that's kind of rude. I'm, I hope. I hope um, Muto can become whole again, and I hope he's not an asshole when he wakes up. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> curious because the emotions that we're giving him back first to are like, or like I guess the ones that Princess Tutu are fi is finding are mostly negative. Like they're mostly really awful mm -hmm. things. It's like I'm gonna give you affection and sorrow and loneliness. Good luck. <laughs> okay, if that's the first things you feel, man, it's gonna be a little difficult right right and the the series hits on it not too fine a point of being like well is is princess aurora really happier being woken up or was she happier dreaming right right and i think i, I do sort of love the way the series structures that in that i think shoujo is 
a genre about very powerful emotions and that emotion that allows emotions to be powerful, but the lesser examples of the genre don't always honor the importance of bad emotions. Like, it is important to be angry and scared and sad and those kinds of things. We like to be allowed to feel those things. And, you know, is that a part of having them come back first? Like, is what is the importance of these emotions to being a full person? Right. Mm-hmm. And I think it is nice to see them explore that um, even more with, like, Fakir 2, at least in episode 6, of, like, when he was actually frightened of Princess Tutu, or uh, Muto was, and seeing Fakir change a little bit, at least there, and seeing maybe why he was worrying about his re- emotions being returned to him, um, even though at the same time, as Chucky was saying, still very abusive, still very weird and controlling. Uh-huh. Um, you don't just get to lock your roommate boyfriend in a room no. because he didn't do what you say. You don't get to do that. Yeah, absolutely not. That is a uh, big old no. Um, I know you're a shitty middle schooler, but you still can't. Yeah. <laughs> you still can't do it. I think one of the biggest things that is curious to me, too, is how Duck is looking at these emotions all as good things and not really considering what she's doing like she's just so gung-ho about like i want to make him happy here is sorrow and it's kind of like <laughs> duck do you even see what you're doing but i she feel is... I... yeah no go ahead go ahead keep, uh, it's keep like going. well she is a duck i mean she keeps like saying that but at the same time like when we see her as princess tutu she acts so different and like i feel like obviously those are both parts of herself um I'm just curious to see how, when those two start to feel more like the same person. No, I, I, I was about to lead into that same point where it's like mm-hmm. Princess Tutu feels like an entirely different character from Duck um, a lot mm-hmm. of the times. She just kind of do sex muckiness right in and I guess hits uh, gives um, Muto back uh, his um, emotions and then just kind of goes off. Yeah, it's by far the clearest case of a character wholeheartedly accepting the role she's been giving it to the point where, yeah, she disappears. Like she's not duck anymore, really. She's like this force almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's weird because, you know, people see that side of her, um, especially in episodes like where they say like, we see this passion in your dancing that we see this, but she doesn't quite bring that out when she's still duck. Uh, But it's obviously there, and it is the same person, and they keep, like, pushing on that. And I really appreciate that. It's, like, a part of you that's just not come out yet. And, like, you just need to find that part of you to persist through you as a whole. And I think she's just trying to, of course, get over the fact that it's, like, no, you're not just a duck. Like, you are you. you, And you can embrace all of that. Yeah, I feel like the series is trying to be, like, it's, I think... In an imperfect way, it's trying to push this wide variety of you're you and that's okay and you should be you. Yeah, and like not necessarily like hold yourself back because I can't kind of going back to what I was saying earlier. She keeps telling herself, "I'm just a duck," and it's like that doesn't don't don't hold yourself back, duck. It's okay. I mean, it's doing it using the fact that it has personified animals now, but I, I've I have a soft spot for the anti Dorina episode because it's like you are a large girl for a ba- for for a very strict um body type that's allowed in ballet like ballet is extremely extremely exclusionary in terms of how how tall you can be and how thin you can be and it fucks up your body the fastest of any dance type oh ballet yeah. but I, I feel like in those moments even if it's you know afraid to have actual fat human characters it's it's trying to be like no no you're okay different body types are good you just have to dance in a way that's good for you like bob fossey he made it work yeah i i I wanted to say like rue just telling auntie rena rena out off like no you're not gonna ever be as good as me it's like that's super rude but at the same time i'm just like but i can see it and i guess i guess it leads into more like of self-acceptance or being able to love yourself more than anything. Mm-hmm. The way I interpreted their conversation was that she's telling Auntie Dorita that she could never dance the same way as Rue because, like, this is my style. Like, you can't copy it. Don't be me. You're you. Stop. I see. Um, and that's, I think, when we first met Rue, I thought she was, like, a cool, nice person. Like, oh, it's Senpai coming in and being the best in the class. And then now I'm just like, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? 
Yeah, she's kind of got the the scary Ojo thing going on, like the the mean upperclassman. But also, the series complicates that right off the bat because Duck's gonna make friends. She gonna make friends though, right? And she's obviously <laughs> interested in helping, or not necessarily helping, but letting Princess Tutu recover Muto's memories because she doesn't say anything about like who who Princess Tutu is, and she probably put the pieces together of like duck disappearing princess tutu's here wonder what that's about um so i'm really curious by her character because i have like my own theories of like who the raven is and like how this all is going to play together and i also accidentally saw the title for the next episode and i was like all right yeah confirmations um i mean that that counts (laughs) it's in the episode preview you're allowed yeah so it's like oh yes what what does the raven have to gain from muto getting his emotions back well i guess he like threw away his heart essentially to like seal the raven but what does the raven have to put away what was the raven doing in the first place questions maybe the raven's the good guy after all yeah what a twist yeah i was i was very amused jockey watching your flailing on twitter uh as you realized that this was where we had to stop for this recording <laughs> <laughs> i was like finally a rue episode no <laughs> Yeah, Rue is Rue is great. I feel like on the continuum of character uh, cinnamon rollness, Rue is much much less mean than Fakir, but she definitely has her stakes in being terrible in these early episodes. Just pours a the- pours a lemonade out. Like I want water. <laughs> I love the thirst metaphor of that scene. I can't take credit for that. Yes. <laughs> She knows what she wants. Yeah, I was very tempted to keep watching him. It's like, but what if I don't tell them? I was like, no, no, no. Just gotta wait one day and then you continue on. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah, I know, I'm so into this show. I also love the idea that it's a guilt trip for writers who have unfinished stories. It's like, hey, your stories are just suffering over here. What are you doing? I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> now all my OCs can die. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have like yeah. a, a few... I do creative writing as well, so it's just like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going. It, it gave me flashbacks to, I think, I think the earliest example of this, in at least this specific format, is a play from like the early 20th century called Five Characters in Search of an Author, who are all sitting around griping that, and I think it was a German play too, well played Princess Tutu, um, of, of a bunch of characters sitting around and griping that they don't really have anywhere to go with their stories deepest lore uh, <laughs> but the they have that quote as uh, or Adel does because she disp- dispenses thematic wisdom along with Bay Arthur the narrator which I can't unhear um, that a story that never ends is a cruel thing which is such mm. an interesting line I feel like yeah because I mean I love fanfic I will defend fanfic to the death but there is that there's that thing now, right? Where like people people always want another official installment. They want to know the Pottermore details. And this is how we get J.K. Rowling. <laughs> like I feel like J.K. Rowling is the embodiment of a story that never ends. It's a cruel thing. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to see that. Like whenever, um, I mean, you look at like so many properties that just kept going and you're like, we know why people wanted that. And obviously money is always involved, but like, there's an end and there should be an end and i think that's one thing that i really love about anime is that a lot of it ends up having just a story to tell it tells it and then it's done for for a lot of them and i think that's really great because we don't get that a lot in like western tv shows that have to go for a billion seasons until it just dies and i think that point is just such a good thing to make because i'm always an advocate of like creators getting to do what they want it's like if they want to stop telling their story then let them because that's so important to let it just come to a conclusion and appreciate what you had from that story and then move on to the next thing. And I feel, I feel like some of it is also not just that a story doesn't end, but sometimes a story does end, but it just keeps going. Right. Especially in the case of like Dragon Ball or something where you finish an arc and you're like, okay, everyone can go happily ever after. No, we're going to have another, another huge battle in the next, you know, Mm. big bad comes out. And I think that, like, especially with an episodic um, story like Princess Tutu, where there's a constant 
new enemy of the week. Um, it has that threat of doing that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I f- totally feel what you mean. Like, at what point do the character struggles become meaningless? Because there's always another power up. There's always another thing. How many more emotions can you get after, quote, all of them are collected? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Like, I, I'm fascinated by that element of the story, and obviously, I have. A lot of feelings about writers who won't stop writing a thing because of Anne Rice. Um, But I think an element of that, too, is that an author changes as, you know, the story they told when they were 20 and that meant a lot to them and that meant a lot to other people who are also 20. is not is not the same story that they can write when they're 35, even if they're writing the same characters, what they believe in and what they've experienced has changed. And I feel like Drosselmeyer literally being a dead author the author has died but he won't stop (laughs) fucking love that (laughs) yeah i hope we get to find out more about him too which i'm i'm sure we will but he's just such an interesting character i love him slinking around the shadows and just kind of appearing when of of course when princess tutu needs him his horrible face yeah i'm still trying to wrap my mind around him i'm just like what is this dude yes do tell me your drosselmeyer thoughts no, like, I'm just, like, constantly, like, thinking, like, okay, he seems like a ally to Duck, but at the same time, it it almost just seems like he's just playing with her. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, is he just having fun? Is he just, like, an asshole ghost that, that, <laughs> that just wants to see, like, people suffer, as you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he has no audience. He's dead. He's just he's just doing it for him. This is a sto- like this is a story for the self-satisfaction of one person with no audience. <laughs> yeah, I could see him wanting to be an asshole at that point. <laughs> <laughs> like like they say write for yourself, but stories that you don't have to write for the expectations of an audience get weird. They get weird and they end in Tarantino's weird foot fetish. <laughs> is that how this ends? Drosselmeyer's <laughs> weird foot fetish? No, this, this is impressive. <laughs> well. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh god, that's horrible. No, that's that's how I don't I don't know. I don't, I don't want fate stands at my door. Never mind. I never said anything. <laughs> I'm gonna say I I think we could go with this a few ways, but what if we don't? <laughs> <laughs> what if what if we don't? <laughs> All right, moving on. Ahem, ahem. Yeah, so I I feel like this is, it's something that's so nice about, and I think we've talked about this in other podcasts. We talked about it on the Kill a Kill podcast, uh, but when a show is, is too core, essentially this first this first crop of episodes, the first six, is essentially all set up. Mm-hmm. It's, you spend it all doing, here's the premise, and here's the basic crew of characters that, that you're going to use. And it, it really isn't necessarily indicative of what the show is going to be. So I guess this is the part of the show where I ask, what do you think is going to happen? Ooh, I think Mr. Cat's going to get married eventually. <laughs> That's... Oh, that whole sub. <laughs> I feel like it's aged a lot better than uh, the creepy teacher in Azumaga Dayo. Mm. But like, I, think I still think he's kind of creepy. I think it's because he's a cat. He is. Uh huh. That makes him a little less creepy because it's like, well, you're a cat, so that's weird. But right. you know. But he he has that whole like, I gotta lick my face. Hold on, I'm real ner- nervous. <laughs> yeah, he, no. he goes over to the um, wooden board as like a scratcher, and it's just, I love cats so much, so I was, I was very into Mr. Cat and his weird, as punishment, you're gonna marry me, it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> question mark. <laughs> but. You had no idea that in another universe, Woody Allen became a ballet teacher. <laughs> <sighs> Oh, dear. I'm okay. sorry, I made it dark. Oh, I was just like, oh, he's just funny. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's going to get married to someone his own age and it'll be appropriate and great. Maybe it'll be a cat. Yay. Maybe it'll be a cute cat. Okay. <laughs> All right, we've 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 wrapped up that narrative thread. <laughs> uh, but next, obviously we're getting a Rue episode and that's exciting. Um. I think we're going to kind of go into, like, the Raven side of things, because I don't think they want to reveal the Prince Muto stuff yet. 
um, just because we need him to suffer more first, and then... (laughs) And then we can discover more about his background. So I think Duck's going to kind of do some investigating here soon. Or we'll stumble upon something that will reveal a little bit more about the story that she doesn't really know about, evidently. Yeah, there's there's a lot of mentioning of, oh, oh yeah, this is all... Drosselmeyer is writing fan fiction of his own work. <laughs> it, it exists, but we haven't actually seen what it is yet, aside of the, the narration. Aside of what B. Arthur has told us. I feel, um, you know, as far as Rune Fakir goes... Like you, you promised me that they're gonna get better, so I'm I'm guessing that they're gonna like watch on with Muto, <clears throat> like they're just gonna wa- keep watching him kind of grow as a person and kind of grow in grow themselves into it somehow. Hmm. Part of me feels like I've done you a disservice by by giving you any indication of future episodes, but also they're all my children and I love them. <laughs> Well, I mean, as far as, like, differences, though, like, I feel Rue's gonna be a little bit more, um, gung-ho. Well, not gung-ho, but, like, she's gonna watch over, uh, Rue, uh, I mean, uh, Duck and Muto, like, just kind of letting it happen and be kind of amused by it. Fakir, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know, but maybe he'll fall in a hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just hoping he gets expelled or something, you know? You know, th- there's a lot of options. Yeah, you could get stuck down in those tunnels with those skulls. That's what that surprised me. It's like, why are there skulls down here? I guess this is a well, intense town. Sometimes there are just towns with scary catacombs under them. Sometimes that just happens. It's Europe. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's vaguely European, Austria, Hungarian. <laughs> I am, by the way, entirely delighted that you two are coming into this in a modern context um, and are completely comfortable calling her duck. Oh. That's not... Fandom really likes to insist that uh, on calling her a hero because it sounds prettier when you put it in the pairing name. I saw that she was listed as, that as her name and I was like, oh, is that part of like the sub, I guess? Is she not called duck? No, it's it's entire. It, it's a fandom thing. It's kind of like number six fandom where, where we all called Nezumi Nezumi because it's weird to have a romantic kissy scene where where you call somebody rat. <laughs> I just call him rat, it's fine. <laughs> but, but it's, <laughs> no, it's, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. But it's part of the story where like this character's name is not a name. That's weird. Yeah. I, I am really sad kinda of going back to what we talked about at the beginning, that we don't get a chance to listen to the sub because whenever I watch a dub, which I actually really do like this dub um, I like to also listen to the sub just to hear the differences in the characters and how they're portrayed in different ways. Yeah, I, I wish I could send you my, my sub. Chiaki definitely sent me a message of like, does Muto sound like this dead inside in the sub? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there was that sort of English dubbing voice of like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of stoned. Um, <laughs> it was totally true. And like, is, is this, is this a case of that or like from his characterization it seems like that's what was supposed to happen so i'm like all right benefit of the doubt this was supposed to happen right <laughs> completely in fairness i have listened to some bad dubs that also sound like that while they were trying to emote yes yeah. yes <laughs> have heard those <laughs> Mm-hmm. but but yes no i i do promise that that is on purpose this dub uh has a pretty robust cast of like superstars of not the Funimation circle, but like the, the ADV who went on to work at, at Viz circle. Like you got Lucy Mm. Christian and it's good. I really like her duck. It warms my heart. Yeah. Duck is great. Yeah. And and as I mentioned at the top of the episode, um, duck and Muto's voice actors kind of aren't around as much anymore, at least in the anime dubbing scene. Hmm. Which is kind of too bad. But like, you know, uh, Fakir is voiced by Takahiro Sakurai, who's extremely busy. Um, the Fruits Basket reboot will probably be out when when these are released. And he's in that right now, uh, voicing Ayane. So that's a thing. And like, Nana Mizuki, who plays Rue, is doing Persona 5. I, loved, I love it when voice actors are still working like 20 years later it warms my heart yeah uh my last question for this episode and actually 
even if it's just as a way to point your attention to it is are either of you at all familiar with with ballet or with like dance in general do you have any interest in it um i'm very mildly familiar uh so i was a clarinet player so we played all sorts of music back in the day um so i've had like some interactions with ballet and then my twin sister is actually very very into dance and she did take some ballet here and there so Mm. i'm a little familiar with it um but not to the extent that i understand every reference in this show there's so many yeah like for me i was um playing in symphonic concert um bands throughout high school so i had a lot of um interaction with a lot of the music here especially you know tchaikovsky is a big (laughs) one um but i personally don't know the dances as well i think the only ballet i've ever seen is the nutcracker which i guess is very pertinent here but yeah i I I I fell asleep (laughs) it's okay it's okay ballet is soothing in that way there's there's pretty people and there's music and there's not a lot of words and it's very warm in the theater and i've fallen asleep at a concert or two is what i'm saying (laughs) i was in fourth grade oh oh baby chalky that's adorable (laughs) yeah that's a i think a little early to take a a group to see ballet maybe maybe not a calm experience well because there's a there's a whole physical language to ballet um and i i is it's something that i would encourage both of you to keep an eye on in the show because um like you'll notice during the uh the third episode with the restaurant uh tutu has dialogue but she's also doing a lot of movement with her hand you know she has dialogue about feeding people but she also rubs her stomach uh so there's a lot of physical language and mime in ballet that um might be talking subtextually alongside the overt dialogue kind of in the same way that you know stories and subtext do and it's one of those things that doesn't necessarily always come through but it's you can tell that the creative team did a lot of research and they'll actually point this out at a later point in the story but i'm just giving you cliff notes now that it's something that they're using quite extensively you know in ballet every movement um every major dance move that uh, chains together to form th- to form a piece some uh will often have a-, a storytelling piece of meaning as well i love that i love that <laughs> oh well, i definitely have to pay attention to that then because i didn't notice that at all somehow well you like one wouldn't think to right because yeah. in, in anime a lot of times you have to and th- this show definitely saves budget where it can. Like, it's got that good old st- that stock transformation like any good magical girl show. Which is very but... cute. I like that she's in a little egg. It's cute. Yeah, yeah this is actually... I noticed they didn't translate... Because I stopped to watch one of the episodes on, on High Dive because I was too lazy to get out my next DVD. <laughs> and I noticed they didn't translate the subtitle um, that, that the show is actually broken into two halves. And this is called The Chapter of the Egg. Oh, interesting mm-hmm. yep. oh yes yes it does it does say that yes 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 chiaki is our is our very informed and knowledgeable fluent speaker on the team she does all those cool interviews and and gets the scoops on cool queer manga coming out of japan because she I've rocks only done one i've only done one <laughs> this is my way of getting you to do more okay all I'm right i'll send more emails it. out the others you do. <laughs> I mean, as far as like the choreography goes, I, I don't understand a lot about what each individual movement really means, but I can I can really see that um, everything is very well researched as, as far as just how all the characters move in the anime. Like even for an early 2000s, 2000s um, anime, it's, I was impressed by how everyone just dances. Yeah, it's not always like, oh my god, Sakuga, but there's a lot of deliberateness to the way scenes are boarded, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even, And I respect that. Even kind of without the powers that they start pulling in when they get into their little dance battles, um, you can definitely feel the emotions of each of the characters, especially with Auntie Dorina and how aggressive she was um, mm-hmm. in each of that. And it's really cool. That's another thing that I'm curious about is like what sort of powers go with Princess Tutu. Because she could just, like, make vines and stuff. So 
that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot to plumb there. Um, well, we're getting <laughs> on. <laughs> sugar plum. <laughs> oh, oh! If you think we're getting out of this anime without some sugar plum fairy. <laughs> Oh, mistake. yeah. I feel like I need to start writing down every single, like, parallel to other things. Like, um, Yuto's sword, there's the two swans. Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. And it starts, every... they meet in a lake, kind of, and, like, Duck is looking off as he's dancing over the lake. It's like, hmm, hmm. Okay. <laughs> every time I, every, every so often I think about doing recaps of the series, and then I think about how much research I'd have to do, because I don't know that much about classical music. And then I sit down for a while, do something else. <laughs> uh, well, we're getting a little bit on towards an hour. Do you guys have any anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to say about these first six episodes? Oh, I do like how it predicted that Fire Festival would be a disaster a little bit. I laughed so hard. <laughs> it's like Shout out to Jar Rule. <laughs> it's a little thing. It's Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Thank I, you. I, I needed to say that. that <laughs> I needed to say that too. Good. <laughs> it must be mentioned. Oh, what about you, Chiaki? Besides the amazing synchronicity of Fire Festival. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's about it. I think. Um, I'm looking forward to finding out more on the Raven side. Um, I'm definitely enjoying myself watching this. I'm so glad. You always have that moment, you know, where like. I like this show. What if I show this to people? And they hate this show. <laughs> I did really like um, Palamoni and her husband. I liked their engagements of like, you're trying to dance this character that's not right for you. Let's do something yeah. better for you. That was good. There, there's a lot of good supportive husbands and boyfriends in this show. It's nice. <laughs> it is a very heterosexual show, despite the fact that all, literally all four main characters are shippable in just about every configuration. <laughs> I'm just totally saying, like they that. just all need to kiss together. <laughs> just hug pile. A hug yes, pile. good. Yes, good. Polyamory. Mm, good. Mm. <laughs> well, if you are following along with us at home, next episode we will be covering episodes 7 through 13, which is the rest of the chapter of the egg. Uh, it ends the first, the first core. And, you know, as we mentioned, you can find it only in dub, but you can find it on uh, Hulu if you're in the U.S. or on High Dive, which I think covers some other regions. Or you can get that really nice remastered Blu-ray. Huh? Huh? The colors look so pretty. I'd say that wraps it up for this first episode of the Princess Tutu Watch Along. If you enjoyed this, you can find more episodes of our podcast by searching Chatty AF on SoundCloud. And if you really liked it, you can toss us a dollar on Patreon, which goes a long way to creating more anime feminist content on the website and in your earbuds. If you want to hear more from our contributors, including Chiaki and including uh, Miranda on the podcast side, you can go to our website, www.animefeminist.com. You can also find us on social media. We are on Facebook at Anime Fem. We're on Tumblr at Anime Feminist. And we are also on Twitter at Anime Feminist. Thank you so much for listening to us, Anna Fam, and until next time, dance to your heart's content. Bye.